Ravina Kamari Setia, Silpi Pratarachaya, and Shuman Sako. Thank you very much for agreeing to discuss the latest development of competition law and policy in India with a focus on the development in digital markets and regulation of digital markets, or rather regulating competition in digital markets. We know that India is one of those remarkable jurisdictions showing unprecedented development in many uh, digital markets, and probably India can be called even a trendsetter in some, and it would be very interesting to learn uh, about the, the developments, the main problems, the main interesting uh, cases uh, from, from those experts who are inside this very rich and very you know, interesting, uh, specific, unique uh, country and, and uh, legal regime. So without further ado, I propose we structure our conversation with kind of looking first at the main background about India, Indian competition law, and then shifting the focus more specifically to the latest development in digital markets. So Shilpi, maybe I can ask you to highlight to us, to remind to those of us who are already familiar, familiar with the development, how young or old competition regime is, what were the main sources of inspiration, if there were any, and where we currently are in India in, in, in its development of com in competition law. Thank you, Oles, and thank you for having us uh, on this panel and talking about India, which, as you highlight, is a very important jurisdiction uh, to be talking about these issues. So uh, Indian competition law, um, the framework that we have presently, India's Competition Act was enacted in 2002. Before that, we had an older competition law framework, which was called the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, uh, which was enacted in 1969. Um, and at that time, India had a socialist model of economic development. So um, the, the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act was more about curbing monopolies. And then when India liberalized its economy in the 1990s, then um, it made certain commitments as part of its uh, multilateral, um, international multilateral um, trade agreement, the WTO um, commitments that required it to have a modern competition law framework, which was more about promoting competition than, than merely about protecting monopolies. Um, so with that in mind, um, uh, a committee called the Raghavan Committee was set up, uh, and the Raghavan Committee looked into uh, a, a number of different uh, international jurisdictions where competition laws were already in place, and then sort of recommended the framework for in India's competition law that we have currently. Um, and um, so we have recently had uh, amendments to the Competition Act as well. Uh, just a few months ago, so it's it's an evolving it's an evolving framework. Um, so in short, that's basically the history of uh, India's competition law. Uh, Ravina, thank you very much, Shilpi. Ravina, if I can revert to you and ask maybe to to expand a little bit on on these and maybe explain what are the sources of inspiration, maybe or which model have has been selected as the the basic one, and maybe other aspects as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for having us on this panel. Just to add to what uh, Shilpi said, I think, um, importantly, the Indian regime borrows a lot from the European regime, and even the Raghavan committee and the committee which was formed to amend the Competition Act um, recently both relied on European jurisprudence and from the, on the TFU. Um, to see how well we could align Indian practices to best global practices. And especially given that the EU has been a leader in terms of um, regulation of competition law and um, regulating markets, it's been a source of inspiration for the Indian regime at large. Um, in terms of highlighting the evolution, I think just to add to um, what Shilpi said, we had a very a uh, regulated sort of economic environment um, prior to 1991. And 1991 is generally regarded as the year when our Indian economy opened up more to free market practices. Um, in order to align the competition regime with this free market change and economy, the Competition Act was enacted and it had a broader scope in terms of regulating players who possess some amount of market power rather than only monopolies 
um, which was the case prior to this amendment. Um, that the, the Competition Act of 2002 is broadly based on the TFEU and current 101, 102 and merger regulations. Um, the one key change I thought um, in the middle is definitely the leniency regime, uh, which was brought about to ensure that, you know, participants in a cartel um, feel like they can come and disclose that uh, anti-competitive conduct and behavior. And in return for assisting the commission, they get a reduction in their fine. I think that proved to be a game changer in terms of antitrust enforcement, especially on the cartelization side, because that's really um, led to over 15 cases still now being decided on the leniency regime and on voluntary disclosure of cartels by participants, which also showed um, the way in which our markets, for example, um, worked in a slightly more ad hoc manner in certain industries. And it brought about the need to ensure that competition uh, awareness per se and competition training became a routine activity for most corporations across industries. Um, apart from that, as she pointed out, recently, um, just a few weeks ago, our new Competition Act uh, or Amendment Act has been uh, approved by both houses of parliament and received presidential assent. And this act moves a step forward to ensuring that the commission works hand in hand um, with corporations and with entities um, you know, to ensure that the competition regime moves in accordance with industry practices and changing technology, especially given that we're moving into highly digital markets and the um, sort of complexity of these digital markets and corporations is something that the commission can grasp truly and be able to regulate to the best of its capacity. And uh, in addition to that, we also now have a committee which is looking specifically to ensure that big digital players are regulated in a different aspect and different form, uh, which is a big shift forward and also again aligning with other mature jurisdictions like the EU, the UK, as well as the US, uh, to ensure that there is some level of parity in terms of regulation of these players. Thank you very much, Ravina. I think we will, uh, because we are Digital Markets Research Hub, we will focus on these issues more specifically if if if, if all participants are okay. If I now probably uh, uh, revert to you and Shaman, please, and maybe you can uh, add uh, about the, the development, maybe looking at the perspective how natural, how organic it is already for uh, for Indian businesses, for different industries to be aware of, of competition. Is it something uh, very, you know, it, it, part and parcel of their uh, of their function and routine or is something which is somehow which exists in isolation from their daily life so there definitely has been evolution on the on this aspect as time has gone by so uh, just taking a cue from ravina and shilpi as well as and then where ravina left it off uh, the the bill was brought about uh, to propose the original competition act in 2002 it was passed by the parliament and uh, approved in 2003 and it wasn't really brought into effect in 2003 itself. It was actually uh, sort of in abeyance for a bit. Uh, there were certain challenges which were brought to it in terms of uh, how appeals from uh, the CCI would really uh, go up and how that would really work out. Uh, this particular process uh, led to the first set of amendments being brought to the Competition Act much before the implementation of the Act itself, which was in 2007. Uh, so in 2007, we saw an appellate body being created in the act itself, which would take up cases in appeal from the CCI, which is the competition regulator in India. Uh, post which in 2009, we saw the staggered beginning of the implementation of the law itself. Uh, this implementation also, and this sort of brings me back to the question that you asked uh, in terms of how it has been uh, sort of uh, seen by industry as such. Uh, we did see a little bit of uh, skepticism in the industry as to how uh, this law would be implemented. Uh, we did have a pre pre predecessor law or a precursor to this in terms of the MRTP, which will be referred to, but uh, the, the, the entire scope of that law was very different. Uh, there was really no merger control under that previous uh, uh, law at all. So it was expanding far beyond what the original law was. Uh, it took some time for industry to accept and acknowledge and uh, I would say uh, come to terms with a modern competition law, uh, which is why again the implementation was staggered. So in 2009, and the CCI actually just this month celebrated its annual day, which is which they celebrate on the day on which the first set of uh, 
uh, the, the, the sections of the Competition Act were implemented in 2009, uh, which was on the, on the enforcement uh, provisions. So the entire set of uh, laws on cartelization in terms of uh, vertical arrangements, et cetera, were implemented in 2009 and brought into force in 2009. We didn't see merger control being brought into effect until two years later in 2011, um, in June of 2011. So, uh, this was also again uh, linked with how uh, the industry sort of believed that the CCI would be able to handle cases coming before it. But over the years, what we saw and realized was that the government was serious about it. They did, uh, you know, grant a fair bit of uh, some uh, to the CCI for capacity building. We did see a fair number of officials actually. Uh, you know, going to the EU, going to the UK, going to the US to learn best practices. Uh, that sense of uh, uh, collaboration and considering the law is a fairly global law, its its principles are fairly global. Uh, it was easy for them to, for the case, for the for the officers of the commission to pick up uh, principles and understand best practices from their counterparts in other jurisdictions. So, uh, in 2011, we did see the full law being brought into force. So. Uh, and over the years, I think uh, there's little that the industry can really complain about in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the law being implemented the way it has been. There is uh, a fair, uh, I would say, uh, it's it's fairly clear that the commission is not, does not want to be a hindrance to any form of business activity. Uh, and that hesitation, which perhaps was originally there, I don't think it exists today. I just wanted to add, um, maybe just following up on what uh, Ravina and Anshuman said, um, just in terms of a number of themes that they picked up on. So one being sort of the difference between uh, EU law and in the similarities and differences between Indian law and EU law. So uh, and um, sort of the implementation of the Indian law. But um, so in my view, one of the major differences between Indian law and EU law, which was also sort of coming out from in uh, the origins of Indian Cooperation Act in the Raghavan Committee report um, is sort of this, um, the guidance given to industry, right? So we have guidance notes uh, uh, under uh, EU law. We don't have that in India. And the way that Indian law is structured, for instance, the rule of reason analysis under section 19.3 of the Competition Act, it just gives a set of like few factors that the CCI has to consider when they're doing a rule of reason analysis for vertical agreements. And similarly, um, to understand dominance, uh, if a, if a entity is dominant, there are a set of factors given under section 19.4, but there's no guidance about how these uh, factors are going to be considered. How will they be weighed and balanced? Is something more important than the other? And the CCI has taken a very broad approach, right? So for instance, when it comes to dominance, they say that we're going to look at everything and take a holistic assessment. But what does that even mean? Because in some cases, they look at some factors and others, they look at other factors. Um, for cases that are very, uh, very similar markets, like sort of digital markets, they look at cases, they look at dominance very differently, they look at market shares very differently. So this is one area where, um, which I wanted to highlight, which I think is a significant difference between sort of uh, other laws in Indian law that we have this kind of vagueness which has deliberately been built into the law but the Raghavan committee said that uh, there should be more detailed guidance given on 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 these aspects but we have not been able to develop that so even sort of in terms of penalty determinations right so that was one of the areas of criticism um, a significant criticism uh, where we still don't have guidance on how the CCI will determine penalties. So these are areas where um, we, I think, need to kind of really significantly evolve in terms of in terms of rules. Thank you very much. Yupi. If if we can stay on this topic, and uh, Rivina, if I can revert this question to you uh, to elaborate it further. So CCI uh, Competition Com Commission of India enjoys supp supposedly quite quite rich discretion uh, from what Shilpi just said and uh, maybe we can you can uh, elaborate on this and explain to us what is the relationship of the CCI with the government does it instruct the CCI about the priorities or is it something which CCI should infer from 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 the axioms uh, 
uh, economic wisdom which they are best equipped to do and what are maybe what are these priorities what is the role of uh, broader societal goals is it somewhere in the pantheon of different values or is it something which is rather beyond the scope of, of focus uh, of the cci um so i think uh, to derive that would be just to infer between the lines or consider from unwritten rules because there are no written priorities per se um given and therefore nothing is a non-priority in that light um, but I would think that at least in terms of our practical experience whenever we have met the case officers or read through decisions I think one thing that comes across is that they do keep in mind where the country is at in terms of uh, digital evolution in terms of government's initiatives in terms of other regulatory in interventions in a particular industry etc and they do keep these factors in mind while determining um, conduct or even if not conduct, at least at the bare minimum penalties. Um, I think uh, in terms of government intervention uh, beyond framing the statute or notifying certain uh, you know, aspects to the statute, um, you know, the government has a more limited role to play in terms of um, implement in terms of the CCI's actual powers to investigate or implement its decisions, etc. Um, on that front, the CCI is independent of the government, and in fact, government departments and uh, completely public uh, owned entities are also within the ambit of the Competition Act and are treated at par with any other private entity for that matter. Thank you very much, Ravina. Uh, and Shuman, let me steer this uh, qu question to you as well. So uh, I think uh, in terms of priorities, I agree with what Ravina said. It, they really don't have priorities per se, which are documented. Internally, they might have, uh, you know, certain... Uh, so let, let's let's look at it, how a case really comes up to the CCI. A case can come up to the CCI through multiple routes. It can come up with uh, a reference which is made by the government itself, where the government requires the commission to investigate a particular uh, sector. Uh, it could be when uh, uh, an information as a complaint is called under law in India is filed with the CCI by a person like you or me uh, or a trade body or a company itself uh, to investigate a particular sector. Or it could be done sumo moto as well where the commission picks up on maybe news reports or it sees some events happening in a particular sector and they wish to uh, go ahead and investigate what really is. Is, is there any anti-competitive conduct really happening there? Uh, in all of these situations, uh, we really, if you look at the trends from the last 10, 12 years that we have now of jurisprudence, we can't really build a trend of priorities per se. Um, another reason for this is that under law in India, if any complaint or information as it's called is filed with the commission, there has to be a final order on merits. Uh, what this really means is that they have to take into account uh, any information filed and they have to assess if there is any merit in examining that complaint further in detail. So either you would have at a prima facie level uh, up front, the commission coming up and saying that the investigation is not required in this case because of X, Y, Z reasons, or there would be a situation where the commission at a prima facie level would find that uh, there is merit in investigating this further and would pass that matter on to the Office of the Detector General, who would then conduct a detailed investigation. So practically in every case, uh, they would have to take this uh, approach. The law does not give them the discretion, uh, at least in this space, while they have discretion in a lot of other spaces, for example, penalties that should be mentioned, they don't have discretion in this space as to figure out what they want to really focus on. So, which is unlike a lot of other, uh, you know, regulators around the world, which I believe do have that discretion. For example, I believe JFTC has that discretion to take up cases uh, or not take up cases, even in in situations where they are they are faced with a leniency application, they can decide that this particular uh, sector is not uh, something which is uh, relevant or uh, is not a priority sector for us right now. So we can we can take this up later. But that's not that freedom is not available with the Indian regulator at all. So priorities wise, I think uh, they are a little hamstrung. Um, but generally, what we have seen is that uh, most of the sectors which which are being investigated globally at least in the digital space are also being investigated in some form or shape right now in india as well so pretty much the same concepts which 
would be investigated in Europe in the last few years would either be already investigated or are being investigated in India uh, and the same companies are involved. So uh, that way, I think, irrespective of prioritization, that has not really hampered the commission's, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, working in 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 a way to uh, figure out and see where uh, anti-competitive conduct, if any, is happening in digital space also. So that's what I leave it. Thank you very much, Anshuman. Um, and maybe the last question about the general uh, competition law uh, before reverting to digital markets we have somehow highlighted the past the present maybe we can have a look at the tra tra this trajectory uh, Shilpi, uh, at the where we are currently are what are the main trends so to say do you see that the 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 the, the regime is developing in the right direction is there something which requires uh, maybe there are some systemic features which prevent prevents its evolution in the right the, what is right direction that would be each subjective uh, view of course maybe you can highlight it with some references to some landmark cases right so just also just to add to the previous discussion and what Ravina and Chuman was saying so in 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 my sort of entirely subjective view, and they might disagree with me. So I think initial enforcement CCI uh, was more around cartels. So cartels were sort of priority areas. Uh, we still see very little enforcement of vertical agreements. So um, just a handful of vertical agreements have been um, found to be anti-competitive. Um, under the rule of reason analysis. And of course, abuse of dominance, we are seeing that happening. And now with big tech, that is becoming more. So with big tech, the cases against Google, which of course we'll come to, but the cases against Google were, uh, uh, and make my trip. Uh, so there were two cases against Google, one case against make my trip, which happened recently. Uh, and these were all mostly uh, uh, abuse of dominance and some vertical agreement issues, but there was also this entire disc uh, in, discussion about whether the abuse of dominance was an appropriate case of abuse of dominance for instance the make my trip case was a uh, was a case on mfn clauses and it was brought as an abuse of dominance but in my view it should have been better brought under as a vertical agreement case so um but i'm going slightly on a tangent um so um so primarily cartel cases have been enforced, some abuse of dominance cases, and then very few vertical agreement cases. And then with merger review, we see that not a single merger has been blocked. So uh, the mergers that have been problematic have been allowed subject to remedies. Uh, so that's been broadly the enforcement picture. Um, and um, we see that there has been sort of different trends that the CCI uh, sort of went through in terms of like in terms of phases. And some people say that these phases were uh, um, arising from who was chairing the CCI. So the chairperson kind of directed the CCI in a particular direction. That is one view that I've um, that I've heard. Um, so initially it was more of a pro enforcement uh, uh perspective there was quite a bit of enforcement happening uh and then sort of i think in the in the mid like maybe 2012 onwards or 2000 no sorry 2014 15 onwards when big tech started sort of when digital markets became more ascendant i think there was an uh, an attempt to bring down enforcement right so to encourage sort of innovation there was this entire uh, a lot of the orders were talking about sort of balancing innovation uh, with competition. So sort of a very cautious approach towards enforcement. And then now we see more vigorous enforcement happening in in, in digital markets. So um, that's, that's my view of how it's going. Um, in terms of where it will be, so I think, um, you know, we've had uh, enforcement has been slow. So even though now we are enforcing, enforcement is still very slow. Uh, it, uh, and I know that this is not just an India problem, but with India, we have some specific problems about constitution of the CCI. Um, the CCI only has sort of three members. It's a small, uh, it's a small institution. And there is some concern about the size. So if, if only three people are deciding on cases, uh, you know, the diversity of views are limited. Um, so sort of uh, this uh, this was a conscious decision by the government to reduce the size of the CCI. 
and uh, there are views that say that it should be expanded so that you have more rich views coming out of the CCI. So with only three people, you know, you don't even have any dissenting views. So earlier we used to have a lot of dissenting views on CCI orders, and then it took a while for the uh, the CCI to appoint a new chairperson. So with digital markets, you can't do those kind of things. You can't like have the CCI stop functioning and waiting for the appointment of a chairperson. So that is, uh, I think, something that this, that needs to be taken note of. Uh, but on the substantive perspective, my concern, looking at the recent CCI orders in terms of the future, is just the complete lack of jurisprudential soundness of these orders. So I feel that there is no jurisprudence that is coming out of these orders. It's basically a factual an assessment, but there's no discussion about, uh, about legal provisions, how they are being interpreted, what are the standards of interpretation, um, what are even sort of say evidentiary standards that the CCI needs to meet in order to find conduct to be anti-competitive. There is very, very little discussion uh, about that in CCI orders. So that makes it very hard to have a strong foundation upon which competition law can evolve. Uh, even in terms of when we're talking about sort of what the CCI is doing, if, if there's no real jurisprudential analysis, then how do we even assess sort of um, or evaluate the CCI orders? So to me, that is a big concern. Um, going forward and uh, we can talk about sort of I have more specific points in terms of specific concerns uh, with with orders and digital markets that we can talk about later. Thank you very much Shilpi. Rowena let me just shift this set of, of ideas uh, articulated by, by Shilpi to you and how would you want to reflect and maybe expand a little bit as well uh, on these things. Um, so I think that was very helpful, um, you know, to do a trajectory in terms of what types of cases have come forward and what trends we've seen over the years. Um, I think in terms of uh, the fact that some of the orders, for example, they don't really contain much to hold on to in terms of developing jurisprudence um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, I do agree. I think some of the orders, especially those closing investigations, are extremely brief. And they are very uh, fact specific. Um, we also see this, for example, in merger control cases, especially in the context of minority shareholding and minority rights being acquired. Um, there still remains a huge lacuna in terms of understanding which types of minority acquisitions may still be regarded as exercising strategic influence or control um, in a target enterprise or not. Uh, and each case that you see in the recent past that has come out provides a different set of, of factual um, circumstances and the analysis has also remained extremely factual. There's only been one case, for example, which is um, maybe Intas Chris Capital or RGO, which is Reliance Geo, which provides some amount of um, jurisprudential analysis or in terms of, you know, what might be regarded as um, minority rights or what, what might be regarded as control rights. Um, having said that, the CCI has also made an attempt to provide some type of clarifications in terms of rules or standards to be followed, but these have come in the form of FAQs actually, surprisingly, not practice notes or guidance notes, but actually, you know, frequently asked questions or FAQs which were uploaded uh, in September last year, and these are detailed around 100 plus pages uh, with different question in a question answer format trying to um, help us expand on different concepts and where there would be a need to notify what might be material influence, etc. So it's really been a process of uh, trying to sort of uh, pick a needle from a haystack on a case by case basis and hang on to one one line of, um, you know, obiter in these very factual decisions otherwise. So I would agree with her on that point. Thank you, Ravina. And Shaman, what would be your reflections on, on, on this point? I won't diverge too much from what the ladies have said. Uh, there's little to disagree there. Uh, this is something which is uh, which has been up uh, in debate since pretty much the initial days of the commission's existence also. From the first few orders, uh, I think one of the complaints we had as, as practitioners uh, was that the order should be a little more reasoned. Uh, and that is something which maybe I can to a certain extent uh, 
uh, say that has gotten better to a certain extent, but not where we would want it to be. I think again, uh, as Ravina mentioned uh, right now, and she had mentioned earlier, the absence of any practice guidance or any guidance notes or any uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, except the FAQ that we have now, uh, there is really no uh, you know, and the FAQ actually in fact also sort of refers back to the cases where it don't have very reasoned orders. Uh, so you know, it sort of is a jigsaw where we are aren't able to put together the pieces uh, always uh, as when you only read those cases. Uh, fortunately for us, for some of the practitioners who worked on those cases, you have a little more insight because you understand the, and you've had those discussions with the, with the staff at the commission, but an external person who's reading just the order would not be able to comprehend the entire set of facts altogether and what the reason or rationale for coming to a particular conclusion really would be. So I, I agree with Ravina and Shilpi there on that fact as well. Uh, I think there is that is something which uh, which which definitely uh, is is a point where there could be significant improvement on both the enforcement as well as the merger control sides. Um, merger control not so much. Uh, of course, there are very limited set of uh, you know uh, facts, but of course, control issues as as Ravina mentioned. Uh, what we have seen over a period of time is a certain set of facts which are appearing in that particular case appear in the in the beginning of the case itself in the order itself and then uh, you are sort of left to infer how uh, you know control was really uh, passed on so that way if there is a certain set of uh, you know maybe tests which are made public in a, in a guidance note or a practice note it just would be a little easier for uh, not practitioners but even you know corporates themselves and industry themselves to figure uh, the basics out. Of course, the FAQ is a step in the right direction, but of course, a lot more could be done. Let us now move. Thank you very much, Anshuman. Uh, let us now move to the digital part. And maybe it would make sense for us just to highlight uh, or remind the specific, unique position in many respects with, uh, in which digital, digital markets in India uh, find themselves and that um, maybe to compare it with the situation as we somehow understand it in, in the European Union and the UK, India is obviously a much bigger market, much more homogeneous in one respect and much more heterogeneous in another. And it's obviously a so generous uh, territory with so rich development. Shilpi, if, 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 if you can start with you trying to somehow to, to provide to this, this 3D picture of, of of the development of, of digital markets in India? Yeah, so that's a, a, a very big task to do sort of briefly. Um, but I think um, with India, because, because as you mentioned, the size of the market, the population, the scope for growth uh, of digital is tremendous. And as we know, sort of big tech looks for uh, growth, right? So economies of scale, scope, and so India is a very attractive market in that sense. Uh, but I think that the, um, yeah, I'd just like to highlight sort of some specific aspects because I think we don't have time to have a broader discussion, but maybe Ravina and Anshuman can, can uh, add here because I'll, I'll just be very specific. So what is interesting to me is the tension between the traditional markets and the digital. So for instance, we see this tension in e-commerce, for instance, with the local mom and pop stores or the, smaller uh, uh, sellers uh, now having to rely on Amazon and Flipkart, or which is owned by Walmart, uh, the big e-commerce players to sell their products. So this tension comes through now with, uh, with these uh, smaller sellers, the vendor associations bringing cases to the CCI against uh, Amazon and Flipkart, right? Because the traditional markets are very dispersed, right? You would go to the local market you would have a relationship with the, the seller that you're selling, that you're buying from. Uh, you would have discounts. You would have these very, very sort of cultural exchanges where, you know, the seller, you know, you would, the seller would offer you certain, um, you know, benefits or certain things. And it was, a and each uh, part of India would have like a different cultural way of doing business. Um, and now sort of it is becoming more homogenized with, with the coming of big tech, with the coming of digital. So it is a, a bit of a tension because I think Indians still, they do like that culturally, 
sort of small store where they can rely upon and they can go and buy from and but at the same time the the prices and the convenience of big tech is attractive so that is uh, um that is one area of um of kind of tension that um from a broader perspective and then also plays out in other places in other in other areas like uh, what we see with uh, with hotels. So small hotel owners are now being aggregated through this player called Oyo. Uh, these hotels have now sort of brought cases against Oyo as well. Um, again, this kind of discord, right? So the small, the small hotels have their own kind of cultural context in India. And now they're being sort of franchised um, through Oyo. They're being standardized through Oyo. So this process of standardization uh, I think it's very new to India because India is, as you mentioned, so heterogeneous. It's um, it's part of the Indian experience to be heterogeneous. But now sort of this move towards standardization creates some tensions. Um, and then also with, uh, with the restaurant players similarly. So again, sort of coming together through uh, Zomato and Swiggy that are restaurant aggregators. Again, there's tension there. Uh, between the restaurant players and the so the the tension between the smaller players small business is at the core of what india does uh, of indian business um because the larger businesses are very few right so we've had like you know the 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 reliance the tata the billa they're few big corporate houses um but the smaller players are at the core and now of course we have this kind of startup culture coming up in india so um and they have global ambitions. So you have like EdTech, for instance, which is doing well globally, Indian EdTech companies like Baiju's. Um, so that's another aspect of it. Um, but, but broadly speaking, that is sort of more interesting to me from a digital perspective. And um, I can add more later, but yeah, just to give like a broader perspective, yeah. Thank you, Shilpi. Ravina, let me shift it to you, please. Um, I think she's pretty much covered the key evolutions, but I think one thing from a competition standpoint is that the CCI, you know, even, even till eight, seven, eight years ago, probably was not equipped at all to understand digital markets um, in the same manner. And, you know, we've seen, for example, cap aggregators get away with a lot of cases um, you know, just on grounds that it was an algorithm deciding prices and not really so much of human intervention, for instance, and cut to, you know, now the Google cases, etc., where these algorithms and the way in which preferential treatment, um, you know, is being used by platforms and especially these, uh, you know, these big digital companies is being scrutinized with much, much more detail. So we've seen a broad shift from uh, the manner in which jurisprudence has evolved in a short period of maybe five or six years with the CCI becoming more conscious of uh, the way technology can really be used and how even algorithms or even, um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, technical tools can be used in order to um, ensure self-referencing, data sharing, um, and, you know, uh, especially use that to increase marketing advertising revenue uh, amongst other anti-competitive conduct. Um, so I think that's really, um, I think she's covered the other cases. I won't get into that because then we'll, we'll be here for the next two weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Ravina. And Suman, will it, will it for you to conclude on this kind of reflectory part of, of the development of digital markets and the role of competition authorities? Or maybe we'll, revert, we'll have a separate question on, on, on the mechanics, but mm. more, more on the trends, so to say. So I think just on the trends, I'll just cap it up with what uh, what the ladies have said. Principally with the fact that, uh, you know, with with uh, and Shilpi mentioned the startup uh, culture that we have right now. I think India and Israel put together. I think have the maximum number of startups in the world at the moment, uh, and we are seeing startups right now across sectors: health tech, ed tech, uh, agri tech. Which which again, there is a there is a lot of scope for application within India itself. Uh, there has been a bit of, and in addition to what Shilpi and Ravina again have mentioned, uh, not just with the traditional markets, now what we are also sort of seeing is a sort of a tension between the homegrown tech to a certain extent with the, with the tech, which is obviously big tech, which is globally big tech. Uh, so we are seeing a bit of that as well in the last couple of years. Uh, 
it's it's still in its infancy and it's sort of uh, it's still starting up uh, there is a bit of tension there as well it's let's it's it's important to see how it really pans out as time goes by but in terms of of of, uh, of of startup culture in terms of digital markets itself we are seeing a tremendous amount of uh, of evolution um, a lot of it is targeted towards india as well uh, a lot of startups are uh, obviously targeting markets in the west they actually don't want to target uh, markets in india at all their their entire principal focus is towards uh, customers uh, either in europe or in the us uh, and those are their principal markets they end up having just their back end uh, you know teams based out of india uh, but their entire market focus is there but there are a lot of uh, you know tech companies which are actually focusing purely on india for example a lot of fintech companies which have come up in the last 5 7 years uh, they are purely focusing on india and uh, that's how you know we are seeing a lot of uh, change in the ma manner in which consumers are actually uh, using uh, tech in their day to day lives i think there has been a significant change in in the manner in which the three of us from india here on this panel would be uh, using fintech in our own lives in the last 2 to 3 years itself so i think there's a lot which has been happening uh, it's it's very fast paced evolution and i think it's going to continue like that for a, for a bit of time to come as well thank you let us still, uh, still keep, keep on this uh, latest point on the uh, and because i wanted to connect it somehow uh, with uh, the uh, how the government uh, tries to some does, does the government want to use the invisible hand of the markets non interventionism or do they think that uh, such uh, rapidly evolving technologies in order to scale up or in, in order to become kind of new universal global universal uh, must have so to say do they need some regulatory support and do they want to maybe somehow instrumentalize competition authorities in this regard do you see, do you see this this being thematized or it's something which we can only infer from indirect observation because there are some sectors in india economy digital economy which appear to be very promising in terms of you mentioned uh, fintech you can also mention kind of ceo production for, for tech companies and probably there are many others more 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 relevant i mean Silpi, do you want to reflect on on, on this probably so um in 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 my view i think um india has what i said earlier india initially adopted a wait and watch, watch approach so they they said that okay we we want to see where these markets are going uh we don't want to regulate in a rush so we want to regulate carefully um and i think the regulate the process of regulation in these markets is also of course inherently political um so you know interest groups lobbying etc uh, and also just given the complexity of the structures of the regulatory frameworks in india so we have telecom regulation which is a different kind of mechanism then you have uh, you know consumer protection which is another kind of mechanism then you have sort of uh, financial regulation um, which is a separate mechanism and then uh, you know the the information technology part of it and then the competition part of it i don't know if i'm missing out something please add if i'm missing out something so and each of these have like their own regulatory mechanisms right so in terms of say why we don't have a data protection law yet uh, is that because the government doesn't want to or wants to encourage industry and therefore doesn't have sort of a privacy law yet i i'm not sure but i think sort of there's been there's a lot of different factors at play uh, that kind of are working towards determining um the 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 different regulatory frameworks and we also have these alternative systems uh such as sort of um you know to create more competition such as the the upi system so sort of other ways of like regulating or bringing about sort of regulatory outcomes uh without having regulations in place that the indian government is doing so the indian Indian government has sort of all of these different kinds of approaches that it's um, that it's taking. So, for instance, with telecom, there is like I think a more fast-paced regulation happening, and then now we have the Digital India Act that's being proposed, um, which which will again be a broader or like all-encompassing type of framework. Uh, we had e-commerce rules that are kind of lying in limbo, but they were they were coming as part of like lobbying from small seller associations. Um, so they they were kind of, they were proposed, but then nothing has really happened on that on that front. So I think there are 
there's politics at play at each of these levels and each for each of these regulations and then sort of them coming together to create this kind of uh, holistic regulatory framework is is another question but i think that to answer your question i don't think it's a a single policy that's driving uh, digital regulation in india thank you very much Ravina, how do you see? Do you see this uh, kind of digital sovereignty discussion, strategic autonomy being relevant for Indian Indian regulatory uh, vocabulary at all? Yes, I think. Um, see, the the present Prime Minister of India has really taken digital India to be one of his pet projects, and the um, digital Indian economy is supposed to be um, is supposed to exponentially generate revenue in India. Um, at an unprecedented scale from this year onwards. And in order to encourage this, they've tried to ensure that uh, public Wi-Fi, for example, is one of the uh, key modes of access, that technology is accessible across the country, even in the most remote parts. Um, they've also encouraged um, Indian India's own sort of uh, Android OS fork, which is called the Bharat OS. So there has been a shift in terms of making sure that India is digitally um, able to stand on its own feet without intervention of, say, um, you know, uh, intervention from or help from foreign companies and without their assistance per se. So I think it does become a question of really um, Indian tech versus global tech and therefore, you know, Indian lobby policy governance as compared to um, you know what worldwide companies may want and require and i think in the same vein we've seen um, that the parliamentary standing committee also recommended that we should have something akin to a digital markets unit which would then regulate these gatekeepers per se so that's not supposed to be um, you know one sort of overarching legislation that covers all digital players including indian players and i think by way in which things will be defined uh, i would estimate that they would only cover five six big global players and the rules for play for them may be a bit different from the indian players um, but having said that, I think as Shilpi pointed out, we are seeing, um, you know, an increased uh, consciousness in terms of the need to ensure that we have legislation in place to counter this rise of digital India. So, for instance, as she said, there are proposed amendments to the e-commerce rules, to telecommunication rules. Um, there's a digital India bill being proposed, etc. And all of these, along with the new uh, committee, which is there to promote competition for digital markets as well, um, broadly aim to tackle similar issues as what we understand. So it will be interesting to see how all of these sort of come and play together and how will um, sort of the regulatory precedents take place in terms of the Competition Commission and other regulators in terms of their enforcement of each of these similar principles otherwise. Thank you very much, Amina. I, I will revert to this question in, in, in our last round uh, when we will be talking about a little bit about legal mechanics of, of the, 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 the possible solutions to these challenges or, or uh, opportunities, whatever, whatever language we can use. And Anshuman, maybe you can reflect also on this kind of vision about what would be the role the, the Indian government, is there any holistic strategy or it's, it's, it's quite kind of a piecemeal approach? How would you see it? So I think uh, as, ha as it happens in a lot of uh, jurisdictions, not just in India, regulation sort of follows business. It doesn't happen the other way around as it perhaps should. Uh, Let's take a look at the last six years or seven years now. Uh, in Since 2016, when we got one of the largest uh, telecom operators to come in, and I just focus on two things here. One is fintech and one is telecom. Uh, the way these two sectors have really expanded in the last six, seven years, it has opened up opportunities for people who did not even know that the, the, the world existed outside their village. Uh, so practically, it has opened up and allowed them to access information in ways which was beyond, which is beyond their comprehension. So it has sort of brought together uh, people on the same page in a completely different level. Now, which, what it does is principally, it allows people to get access to banking. It allows people to get access to uh, a lot of government facilities. It allows people to get access to uh, subsidies from the government, for example employment opportunities as well. Uh, all of this put together, this was not something which was really contemplated. And of course, as Shilpi and Ravina mentioned, 
you know, legislation wasn't there. It's still it, it's still being thought about, and the regulation is still being thought about. It's it's not something which is unique to India. I think it happens across the globe. Uh, it is sort of following how business has really uh, moved and the pace at which business has moved. Regulation hasn't moved there, but I think we are in this in the in the right direction. We are thinking about pretty much. Uh, all the topics that the rest of the world also is thinking and practically in the last five or six years just because of the impact of these two particular sectors you see a lot more in common with the common Indian man than you would that than you would have seen uh, you know back in the day uh, with the rest of the world so it's a, a lot of tying up of the Indian economy with the rest of the world actually has happened in the last six years because of uh, the change in these two particular sectors. So because of this, I think now we are seeing these uh, laws coming up and regulations coming up, which of course uh, will tie things up together much better. Thank you very much. Let us now move to the issue of, of, of regulation. And um, we know that there are some jurisdictions which have already introduced uh, specific ex ante rules for uh, regulating digital markets in the European Union. We have the Dig Digital Markets Act. In in the United Kingdom, we have Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill, which is still uh, uh, only passed the second reading in the Parliament. And supposedly, if it goes as it uh, it's being proposed by the Department for for Businesses and Trade. It will be part and parcel of competition policy. It doesn't propose, it's not proposed as being a new start, yeah, in contrast to the DMA with its contestability and fairness vocabulary uh, and, and different legal ground intended to develop in parallel with, uh, with the established ex post rules. Philippi, how do you see? Is it is it too early already for us to still for us to somehow to hypothesize about which trajectory has will, will be selected by the Indian uh, model, or we can already talk about it uh, in in more or less feasible terms? Okay, so let me just give maybe a brief history of um, where we're at. So um, the uh, um, so the ministry uh, set up this competition or review committee uh, to review sort of gaps in competition enforcement in India. And the report of the committee highlighted gaps specifically, uh, I mean, on other aspects as well, but specifically with, resp re with respect to enforcement in digital markets, there were sort of, uh, uh, there were um, discussions around the need for uh, further investigation or further uh, uh, study into sort of whether we need uh, a different set of laws to um, competition laws for digital markets. So that's where it all started from. And then the CCI also did these market studies uh, specifically on e-commerce and then telecom. And, and from there also the CCI highlighted competition issues uh, in digital markets. At that time they recommended so self-regulation, but it became clear because uh, after that they started sort of these investigations on those specific issues with respect to certain uh, companies as well. Um, so I think that's where it, it started from. And then of course the parliamentary standing committee um, had this detailed report that they came out with on digital markets. Um, so the um, in terms of where we are going, um, I think it's too early to tell because the, the uh, from what I understand the committees um, tenure has been extended, so they're still deliberating about about whether we need an ex-ante regulatory framework or not, and as well as what that might look like. So I think that is still sort of up for debate. Um, but it, I think in terms of what we can see from what the Parliamentary Standing Committee says is that uh, competition enforcement in India is slow. There are certain specific challenges to that. Um, and therefore, there is perhaps a need for some kind of specific regulatory framework, at least maybe a digital markets unit, as Ravina mentioned, uh, might be sort of something that's needed in terms of capacity building. Uh, but I'm not sure where we're going at with respect to the, the Digital Competition Act. Yeah. Ravina, how do you how do you see this development? Can we are we already at the stage where we can somehow bring some conceptual features, or it's uh, as Shilpi said, it's a little bit too early to 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 be so clear about the 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 direction. 
I think uh, till the report's out, we might not be able to tell particularly where the committee is going with, but they are tasked with primarily six questions and to come up with answers. And one of them is whether the existing law is enough. The second is whether we need ex ante regulation. Um, and the others kind of flow from that. For example, what are other countries doing? What are the options to promote competition? Do we need a different uh, unit? Um, who are identifiable gatekeepers in the Indian context, et cetera? So I think the answers to these questions would, in, in my opinion, um, align with what other mature jurisdictions have already done. And we might see a digital markets unit um, embedded within the competition regime and the CCI itself, and uh, that would operate within the CCI and the ambit of the CCI itself. Um, I also think while the current act does have provision to have technical experts and experts who do understand, for example, coding, tech markets, etc., like there is a provision to engage with such experts, um, ad hoc basis engagement might not give us uh, long detailed results because you need to study these five or six big players in detail from a more historic standpoint in order to understand how their practices develop, what are the trigger points where they change their business policies, how quickly have they historically moved from one line of business to another, how often and in what manner does self-preferencing come into play. And um, I think by the time we get into a stage where this report of the committee can be turned into a bill, we might also have guidance from what the DMU, the DMA, et cetera, are doing in uh, the UK and EU and even in the US, which might be very helpful um, for us to see where we can go. Mm, sounds like, like a very prudent approach. Uh, and Shuman, how do you sense this? How do you observe this, this the discussion? Do you see some polarized views, some, some heated criticism, or it's something which is rather... Uh, collegial and rather unnoticed in, in, in the current kind of uh, agenda? Nothing is collegial in our country. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think this anyway is a topic which requires a fair bit of debate. And I think there is uh, definitely scope for, uh, you know, divergent views to, to, to be there. Um, and both divergent views actually, to, to their own uh, credit, do make sense uh, and do appeal to a fair... Uh, uh, set of uh, you know people as well. So I think there is enough debate that is required uh, for us to get to a conclusion. Of course, the the committee right now has been tasked, uh, as as Ravina and Shilpi mentioned, with uh, with with figuring out what route and what path we should be treading on. But uh, ultimately, uh, they also will have to see uh, you know where 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 the balance really lies, which which uh, path we should be treading on. Should we be looking at a, a uh, full-blown uh, ex-ante regulation uh, like uh, like some so like Europe itself has or if you take a few of the uh, national uh, states as well in terms of Germany or, 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 or even for example the UK now uh, which is looking to go down the path how really it would work out uh, in India um, there is definitely uh, going to be a separate legislation so the existing competition law would remain as is i don't expect that to change especially considering the fact that we've had a set of amendments last month come out uh, for the existing competition law so the uh, the two legislations are expected to work uh, in tandem and in parallel uh, obviously the applicability of the of the digital markets uh, or digital digital competition law as it is called would be would be uh, restricted to certain players in the market so uh, what what level of of uh, regulation we do uh, expect is a little up in the air at the moment. Uh, we can all crystal ball gaze and uh, and and see uh, and 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 put down our thoughts there. But ultimately, the, the committee has been tasked with the uh, with the responsibility of figuring out uh, which which path we should which would be the most appropriate path for the country. And the committee, I I would expect, and from what we understand from press reports as well, is that they have been seeking. Uh, you know, uh, views from a very diverse set of parties, from uh, big tech players, which are global players as well, Indian uh, large tech companies as well, uh, a lot of associations as well of consumers of uh, of uh, and trade associations as well. So I think they are taking in views uh, from a divergent set, which will allow them to appreciate uh, a very divergent set of uh, thought, um, and therefore they should be able to balance views from everybody and put uh, put something down which will work for us as a, as a country. 
not an easy task it's it's an unenviable uh, position to be in but i'm sure they will be able to crack it thank you very much so maybe i can also ask you a question is there is any development in specific uh, case law and specific jurisprudence or ongoing cases which appears to be particularly interesting uh, to mention uh, in the context of our conversation and again maybe let's we'll start with silpi yeah thank you so i just wanted to highlight sort of uh, one jurisprudential development that i have seen uh, coming out of recent uh, cci um, orders one is the primary one is the final order in the make my trip case the other is a prima facie order in the amazon case uh, which is with respect to deep discounting so um, we know that antitrust or competition law doesn't prohibit deep discounting and there's a distinction because predatory pricing is prohibited but not deep discounting um so um in the make my trip order the cci has highlighted the complexity of uh finding a uh, predatory pricing in uh digital market because they say that sort of it's very hard to uh, categorize uh variable and fixed costs a lot of these costs go into sort of building uh uh building networks and network effects and that might be a fixed cost rather than a variable cost so there's the complexity around predatory pricing um but and then they sort of highlighted that um while we cannot bring a finding of predatory pricing against make my trip um but there is uh deep discounting that they're engaging in but deep discounting take in itself is not problematic so what the order does is that it says that deep discounting when taken together with other practices such as uh the 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 wide parity clauses that uh the or that the order was investigating um as well as so price parity room parity um as well as sort of other conduct taken together is an abuse of dominance that's what the make my trip order says and to me that is a bit problematic because we know that for abuse of dominance in general sort of you you determine conduct individually as being problematic but here they're saying that uh individual that it's that it's all of it taken together that's problematic um and as a jurisprudential development that kind of opens the door to a lot of different kinds of conduct being clubbed together and then being held to be problematic without any clear theory of why that is harmful to competition so the cci's theory of why it is harmful to competition is is quite convoluted i'm not going to go into it here because it will take a little bit longer to discuss that but it is a bit convoluted and then they follow something similar in a prima facie order they made in the amazon uh, uh, uh in a case against amazon and flipkart where they again say that the deep discounting taken together with self preferencing and other conduct uh is problematic now let's see what they do in that final order but again sort of conflating a uh, conduct that individually would not be problematic but sort of bringing it lumping it together with other conduct and saying that now that becomes problematic um is is to me concerning as a jurisprudential development in indian competition law i'm still wrapping my head around it and i'm and planning to write about it and thinking about it but this to me is uh something that i wanted to highlight here yeah i think this is quite interesting uh to see how these concepts are being conflated and this is not isolated to deep discounting and predatory pricing but it's also something we see um in merger control as well you know where a certain right taken with another right might be problematic when they individually are not um but i think in my view from a digital market standpoint i think a very interesting development which we will wait to see now if appealed uh, and what comes out of it is um you know the nclat which is our appellate tribunal their decision in the google android matter so the cci had asked google to um, implement 10 remedies which would bring which would have brought about a significant change in terms of google's practices um as a gatekeeper in terms of you know uh, operating android in terms of having apis um and even restricting android other android devices so not just its own phones but other android devices from pre-installing other apps and you know um a bunch of other a bunch of a host of other issues um the entlat interestingly uh, upheld the penalty against google and upheld the anti competitive conduct found against google but rejected four important remedies that the cci had directed google to implement um had those remedies been allowed by the entlat it would have probably brought india uh, in terms of being the leader of the pack um on effecting change from 
a player such as Google in this particular market. So for example, two remedies that the CCI suggested were not remedies that were directed in any other jurisdiction through such a you know, antitrust investigatory regime. For example, allowing other app stores to be listed on the Google Play Store, allowing um, completely unrestricted side loading, um, allowing Play Services APIs to be accessed um, by other uh, entities as well. So not restricting those Play Services APIs. Um, and, you know, uh, these remedies, if implemented, would have really opened the playing field for even Indian or, you know, our independent developed app stores um, that would have really increased the market base for them because they would have gained access to the Google Android platform and the Play Store and been able to sort of distribute more indigenous apps or apps in more regional languages, um, you know, which unfortunately now we are not going to be able to see since that remedy has not been upheld by the NCLAT. Uh, similarly, with side loading, there would have been greater access, for example, to several gaming apps or music apps, which are otherwise not available on the Play Store. Um, because of uh, pricing issues and commission issues, uh, which would have otherwise gained popularity and been accessible, but now may not be so. So in case this decision is appealed by either party, we will know the final outcome decided by the Supreme Court, which I think will be very interesting and definitely a big step forward in terms of regulating digital markets in India from a competition standpoint. I would again uh, just go back to the issue of concreting the issues in the order that uh, Shilpi mentioned. I think it sort of boils down again to writing reasoned orders. I think that is something which uh, is, is something which is which is something the commission can get better at. It's uh, one uh, area where they can definitely improve, and uh, it's hopefully uh, an, an issue which can be tackled fairly quickly and easily. Thank you very much. And now we, we move to this rubric where we, we ask the guests to provide their recommendations, uh, some maybe life hacks about how to, to, to survive in this uh, in this digital labyrinth. I think I'm using your vocabulary, Shilpi. You, you, you talk about regulatory labyrinth in one of your, in your papers. So let's start with you, Shilpi. And what would be your kind of recommendation? Yeah, I think um, it's hard because... Um, as someone who teaches digital uh, competition on digital markets, I find it pretty challenging just to keep up with uh, what what's happening. So I think um, it's important to uh, to stay up to speed with what's happening, but that that can be quite challenging. Uh, learning the tech side of it is very important, which I find myself also challenged by but also um you know having uh, uh the the business perspective so there are so many things that we as competition lawyers who are interested in digital markets have to kind of keep in mind that it that um i think um that is challenging but i think it's also an exciting it's a very exciting place to be and i think uh trying to find the the things that interest you within this larger framework is the way I survive, the way I kind of navigate this labyrinth. Um, so we can't be experts on every aspect of digital markets, but you know things that interest us more, we can sort of um, be more involved in. Um, but it's important to to know all the different sides of those things so that we have a more holistic perspective. I think uh, taking from what Shilpi said, it's so important to sort of keep your eyes and ears open and be up to date with what's happening. But as someone who I, I feel like I've grown as much as or with the digital markets really uh, and really seen their evolution in front of my eyes. Um, one thing that I do feel, especially in the context of antitrust and competition law, is that if you're principles and a basic economic understanding of how competition law should work in a traditional market is sound, then it's very easy to extend and apply those principles, um, even in digital markets. And a lot of it is actually intuitive, common sense thinking. So, um, and, and to be fair, this entire field is advancing and developing as we speak with people just putting in rational, commonsensical points up front to ensure that there is some type of regulation or some type of jurisprudence to evolve. So I would really encourage people to think on their feet as and when they see some change and really critically analyze it for themselves. Um, because you never know when you might be providing an insight that's very much needed uh, and add to jurisprudence as well. 
I will keep it simple actually. It's just it can be a bit overwhelming when you see digital markets and competition law as such. Uh, you need not be. Um, simplify it in your brains. Um, embrace tech and question it. That's all I'd say. Anshuman Sakal, Ravina Kamari Setia, Shilpi Patrachaya, thank you very much for sharing your very bright ideas with all of us.